Where do old aeroplanes go when the time comes to retire them from the sky? Almost one in ten of them are flown to eCube Solutions in Wales, one of the world's fastest growing facilities for the recycling and stripping out of old aircraft. Whatever the customer wants will take off. Every year, around 60 commercial airliners land at the company's designated airbase, and the lads just can't wait to get their hands on them. All these planes, and you just get to play with the biggest toy set in the world. This squadron of high-vis heroes love to get their hands dirty and fly in the face of whatever problems are thrown at them. Yeah, there's pressure. Um, we cool with it. We thrive on it. They join forces to take these old airliners to pieces so their thousands of mechanical components can be sold on to satisfy the growing global demand for refurbished plane parts. Let's get them off the aircraft. But it's a race against the clock to take these multi-million pound planes to pieces before they reach their final destination, the scrapyard. All these are ready to go now, so we're going to have the demolition boys are going to be coming in and they're going to start smashing them up. Join the lads as they battle hostile weather and get to grips with massive machinery. I see them go down smooth, I put it that way. All to meet deadlines set by bullish buyers. Money's time, time is money. And we're not talking penis here, we're talking millions. Welcome to the world of the plane reclaimers. So, good job, Ed. Yeah. It's all quiet on the south coast of Wales this morning. Unusually so. But if anything's certain, it's that the peace will soon be shattered. That's because this airbase is the home of E-Cube, a place where commercial aircraft are taken when they reach the end of their working lives. And there's one inbound now. A Boeing 737-700 making its final flight, and it's due to touch down any minute. There's the uh, next inbound aircraft. It's a Boeing 737 land here with us. Oh, six minutes time but the top team of strippers scrappers and packers have been caught off guard and they're all stuck inside at the team's morning meeting are they about to miss the first arrival of the day a boeing 737 700 it's caught by surprise a little bit it's almost here. The lads really need to jog on. Another aircraft coming in, um, flying in from Amsterdam. The aircraft is now making its final approach, having already flown the majority of its 360 mile final flight. So, just another bowing. This one's an end of life aircraft, a 737 new generation. There it is now. It just landed, just uh, arrived from Amsterdam. It's a 737-700, a modern, what's known as a Boeing 737 new generation aircraft, despite the fact new generations have just been succeeded, actually, by a new type of game. But uh, that's a, um, a quite a sought-after type of aircraft, one of the most um, popular, if you like, to come for the disassembly process, which is going to go through. Bob Hayden is in a race to the runway. As the head of operations, it's his job to meet and greet the aircraft and its crew before his lads can start the strip down. The 737 has now touched down on terra firma. But where's Bob? This smooth operator has managed to hitch a lift and has cruised down the runway. Okay. But has he timed his last minute dash to perfection? Almost. Okay. We'll just have to move the steps back slightly. <laughs> Did it go back a little bit, Sam? If you want something moved around here, then you need team leader Sam and his little green tug. The little green tug, what does it do? It does everything. It's, uh, it's a master of all trades, really. It, uh, we can move the aircraft with it from the uh, 737s, and I've moved the 767s with it, so it's, uh, it's got a lot of power. We use it for moving the uh, ground power units, steps, basically anything that's got a tow hitch on it can be moved with a tug. Uh, it's, uh, it's what it is, it's job, isn't it? 
This aircraft is one of dozens of commercial airliners that come to a crushing end at E-Cube every year. The man with the master plan is Mike Korn. We've coined a phrase, deproduction. We tended to, when uh, uh, the, uh, my partners and I in the business came out of a uh, new manufacturing end of aviation where everything was about production. Obviously, the kind of processes we do here are the opposite, so we, uh, uh, we've played with the idea of deproduction. I'm not sure it's too snappy uh, an expression on whether it will take off or not, but that particular aircraft is, is certainly destined for a disassembly process. The term deproduction might not take off, but the team on the ground just about understand what he means. Under the 737's vast wings, Sam must tackle the first and most valuable takeout of the day its engines. On average, a jet engine like this consists of around 40,000 parts and can reach temperatures in excess of 1,000 degrees Celsius in the hottest part of the engine, where compressed air is mixed with fuel and ignited. Along with his right-hand man, Khalil, Sam has taken new boy Jack under his wing. I've got good, good work in relation with the college and we take, um, we take a lot of the students in on work experience. So we get uh, yeah. we got a few quite a few coming on a Friday and they spend a day a day with us. They split them up between the teams. They'll go through one of the techs and uh, just get involved with all different jobs every time they come. Any stop. issues you see, yeah, shout stop. Then everybody stops. It's tense work. You'll be bringing your top down. With the pressure piling up, it's time to see what young Jack is really made of. Quarter turn each time, like full quarter turn, yeah. Okay. okay? As an apprentice, Jack's never done anything like this before, but his lack of experience won't cut him any slack with Sam. That's because any of his mistakes now could be particularly pricey. Turbofan engines like this one can be sold for up to $5 million a piece, so the new lad can't afford to mess this one up. Jack himself, it's difficult for him, like, you know, when he, he haven't got the experience and the hand skills and the lights, but he's, he's learning. He, you know, he can only get better. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit frustrating because you've got to um, spend a bit of time with them, but I suppose at the end of the day, we all learn, don't we? We all have to be taught sometime. It's quite nervous, quite scary, because just one wrong thing and it could all end badly. <laughs> the engine could just come down without you knowing and it could <laughs> cause some serious damage. One more quarter turn front, only. It's quite scary, but it was really, really good, really, really, really good to get me going again. It's totally different and something that is a total shock of the system because you could come straight in on a Monday morning at 7 and you could be, say, on the wings of one of the aircraft and then the next day you could be dropping the engine or... You do something different every day. There's something always different in this job, which is uh, which gets me going all the time, keeps you on to go for it. Fronts again. Slowly but surely, Sam and the lads ease the multi-million dollar engine down into the purpose-built transport cradle that's waiting underneath. Right off. Yeah. Right, so take the out the bottom. Out the bottom, yeah. This has been a bit of a steep yeah. learning curve for young Jack, but he's impressed, Sam. We've had uh, young Jack out with us. Uh, his apprentice is working with us for a few weeks. Um, he listened to everything he was told. He did as he was told. And he had some good ideas where we had a few issues and that. So, uh, yeah, all in all, he's, um, he's shown that he's got the potential to... Uh, to be a good techie. Go ahead. So now we've just got to uh, get the rest of the um, removal kit off, the uh, bootstrap kit removed from the aircraft, get it all locked away, engine in the hangar, and uh, that should be about lunchtime. We're going to have a brew and uh, something warm to eat. Job done. OK, let's go. With the engines now neatly packaged up, they will be locked and loaded onto a transporter, then shipped out to their new owner, who will check them over and service them before they go straight back onto the wing of another aircraft. And what remains of the Dutch passenger jet has been taken to the hangar, so its strip-down can continue. These hangars were originally built in the Second World War and never meant to house anything as chunky or as modern as a 149-seater passenger jet. Towering a whopping 12 and a half metres tall, the only way to squeeze it into the hangar is to lose a few feet first, and Shippy's the man to cut it down to size. Uh, this is uh, 
737 700 as you can see it's um it'll be going into the hangar so what we've got to do is get the rudder off it and then cut the tail so it'll go through the door so that's basically our task at the moment it has its moments but it's, it's good yeah, i enjoy doing them Everyone around here knows Nick Taylor as Shippy, on account of his 23-year service as a marine engineer in the Royal Navy. There are not many lads around that can match his wealth of experience. It's just a shame that so much of it was at sea and not up in the air. But he's always ready to scale new heights, ably propped up by his wingman. I got the Tackmeister with me today, so, uh, young Tackleberry. I do. He's looking after the lifter while I concentrate on the on the job in hand. It's it's not too bad. It's it's getting a little bit breezy, but it's it's not out. It's not it's not untoward. As they approach the top of the tail fin, the crane is moved into position to take the weight of the rudder so it can be lowered to the ground. It's a tricky job at the best of times, as the slightest breeze can make the rudder swing about dangerously. But it looks like today there's another problem for Shippy to fret about. The rudder seems to be jammed, making it all but impossible to release it from the back of the plane. It looks like one of the bolts is refusing to budge. There's always something new, little problems you've got to overcome, and it, it, different aircraft types have different problems and different different tooling you've got to use, and and it keeps your mind active, you know. And it's, uh, especially when getting a bit older, it, it's good to keep your mind active, like right? yeah. So. Shippy thinks he's got the answer, though. It's a special little something that only experience teaches you. A sophisticated move, which is a cross between a wiggle and a wobble. Can you give him a wibble, a bit of a wibble? Unfortunately, this time, Shippy's wibble isn't quite doing the trick. Maybe what's needed is something a little bit more technical. Putting up a bit of a fight, that's all. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. No matter how big the problem, there's nothing like a trusty old hammer to sort it out. Good there, mate. Oh. Finally, Shippy's done it. Oh. The bolt is free. Oh! Let's let him go now. Bit of a bit of a pressure on one of the actuator bolts, but um, we got we got him out. It's just with a bit of wind pushing him about a bit, so. It, we managed to get him out, and, it's, uh, and it all went quite smoothly after that. But Shippy's not finished just yet. He's only done half the job. The plane is still too big to fit in the hangar with the rest of its tail still on. We'll be using a, a recipe store and a uh, good wishes. <laughs> Like a knife through butter, Shippy's power saw is making light work of the tail fin. Back on the ground, it's the moment of truth. It's time to find out if they've taken enough of the tail fin to cram the plane into the hangar. Yeah, he's just getting that out of the way. Fuselage is eased in, it looks like the job's done. The 737's cropped tail fin has cleared the roof and the takeout can continue. Well, this morning I'll be working on the flight deck, I've been in the cockpit, removing all electronic instruments. Uh, these are pretty delicate and pretty expensive, so I've got to be pretty careful this morning and pretty methodical. This is my game, so I, I've worked on some, some of these things, but you know I couldn't tell you what, what most of this does. Well, we've got six screens here. Uh, we've got standby horizons. There's a lot to do with navigational instruments. I've worked on the standby horizons, which is 
this this part here and a few other instruments, but uh, that's when you'll recognize it from this part of the deck. They're very expensive and uh, very delicate, some of them. This will come down on a hinge, then I can deplug the back, pop it back up and take the units out. Hopefully, they'll come out there quick release, so it shouldn't take too long. But uh, this is the first time I've, I've done an aircraft to the, like this. Technician Ian Ellis may have only worked at EQ for a couple of months now, but he's certainly getting to grips with this confusing-looking cockpit. But what happens to all those switches, dials, levers and buttons once he's taken them out? What can you do with a used cockpit? Funny you should ask. From the outside, this terrace house in Yorkshire might look quite ordinary. But believe me, inside it's anything but. Welcome to the home of David Naylor. This is my house in Barnsley. This is the old way. I've got two floors up, up there. So far, so ordinary. There's a toilet here. This is my kitchen. <laughs> got the utility uh, area there. Cooker, four gas hob there. And then down here is the Boeing 737 New Generation Simulator. That's right. There's a full-size, fully functioning aeroplane cockpit in his dining room. He used to work as a catering manager. Two years ago, David was laid off. He found himself with a bit of spare cash and a lot of time on his hands. I was bored one bank holiday Monday, not what to do. So I went to the local retail and got some wood and started uh, building the structure and went for it from there. And once David started building his cockpit, it pretty much took over his life. So far, I've spent about £16,000 on it. I've been doing it four or five days a week for 16 months, so a lot of hours I've, I've gone into it. I got divorced, so that's why I've managed to get it in dining room, kitchen. Obviously, if I was still married, I wouldn't have had a prayer, but... Who needs a dining room table and chairs anyway, right? David was inspired by his childhood love of aircraft and flying, and he's a stickler for detail. In fact, his 737 cockpit is built from genuine components that have actually come from real aircraft, exactly the type of thing being shipped off the planes down in Wales. The most trying part is trying to find the parts. And there we are. Googling, looking on internet, it's, you know, non-stop looking. I've just learnt everything off YouTube, whether it be soldering, welding, electrics, you know, construction, everything's self-taught. You'd do a, you know, a week's work, uh, whether it be soldering or, or wiring, and realise you'd done it wrong, so you, see, you go back and start again and you feel like smashing it up. Man. David's patience and determination has paid off because his cockpit fulfills his dreams of being able to take to the skies. It may look a bit ropey on the outside, but thanks to the huge screens and live weather feed, David's homemade flight simulator feels just like the real thing. Pop my flaps up. i just come off the throttles a little bit now, so I can level off. And, you know, you, you actually feel as you're turning that you're turning and you're in the cockpit and it's all so realistic. David doesn't just fly solo. It was only ever supposed to be a man toy for me. Turning now. When I did build it, and obviously we're on it 24/7 for about a month, uh, bedding it in. I uh, thought, you know, I'll do my own website and see if anybody else want to enjoy it and hire it out. David decided to see if he could take on passengers, and it's proved to be more popular than he ever imagined. You know, I have three, four people a day. All different ages. I've had, I've had children come with the parents who are seven, eight years old. Some of the older and 85, 90 years old come and use it. They ask the customer if they want to do, you know, a couple of takeoffs and landings, some short flights, so they might just want to, you know, fly to Spain. Today, David is taking just a short domestic flight from Manchester to Leeds Airport, but many of his passengers prefer flying long haul. You can actually fly um, anywhere in in world, basically. And there's over over 20,000 air, airports to um, choose from. If you want to fly to America from Manchester, it'd be what 10 hours. So, you know, 
if you want to fly it for, for normal, it's a full day for you. With such high demand, David's looking to expand his fleet of aircraft. And he's even considering taking on some cabin crew. I'm looking to get an access trolley and uh, maybe employ somebody. But no airline has taken to the skies without experiencing a little turbulence. And it seems not all of David's passengers enjoy such a realistic flying experience. I had one lady um, last month actually had to run out of cockpit and go to the toilet and, and be sick. She was uh, travel sick. Bit of reverse thrust. Leans on the brakes. Welcome to Leeds. Decent London. For David, his friends and family may have been a bit sceptical at first, but now he's hoping the sky's the limit. Initially, the photo were a bit mad, building a, a cockpit in your dining room, kitchen. But now it's fully up and running, turned into a full-time job for me. I think them comments have, have way gone. Now it's turned into a full-time career. It's taken off, basically. Nice wordplay, David. I see what <laughs> you did there. Over in the hangar, it's another busy afternoon of stripping and scrapping. The 737 from the Netherlands is being carefully dismantled, piece by painstaking piece. Everything that can be reused, reclaimed or recycled is removed and boxed up. So we've got pito tube, pito probe. So it's three of them, one this side, two the other side. We've got angle of attack. And so on the bottom here, we've got a tap sensor. They may not look much, but these are all pressure-sensitive bits of avionics found in almost all aircraft to aid the pilot's cockpit instrumentation. For an airline, they'll make valuable spares to be kept on the shelves in case they need to be called into action to replace a damaged or defective part. The first sensor on Sam's shopping list is the Alpha Vane, which measures the aircraft's angle of attack. This one will tell you what the attitude of the aircraft is to the wind flow. Yeah, so. The wind's blowing that way and the aircraft's that way, that'll be at a funny angle like that. And they'll give me a thing in there. It's set in, and then you've got sealant around the edge of it. So he's got to break the sealant. It's just to weatherproof it and uh, make it airtight as well. If it's not sealed, when they pressurise the aircraft, it'll um, end up loads of leaks and the likes. That's it. I mean, God knows how many years worth of dust on it. Next for removal is the pitot probe, which is used to determine the airspeed of an aircraft. But Sam's having trouble with undoing the screws, as they've been covered over by layers and layers of paint. The problem when you start taking screws out, because the aircraft's been painted, the, uh, the slots for the heads get full of paint over the years. Not every plane stays with the same operator all its life. You know, some of the aircraft we've had in here have gone through two or three different operators. And then, of course, when they change countries, they, um, they change registration and everything. The other thing when they're painting aircraft, they've got to weigh it all, because it's to affect the weight of the aircraft. And you know, when you think five litre tin of paint you use at home, and it's that way, you know, it's a fair bit in there. Finally for Sam, he's removing the TAT sensor, which gives the pilots a very accurate measurement of outside air temperature. A lot of the time, there's not enough flex on this to bring it out to undo it. it ends up stuck in air. So you normally have to find, find a young one who's skinny. You can go down there and un undo the pipe for us. But, uh, I'm quite lucky on this one. Apart from the wrong size spanners again. There we go. Nice work, Sam. All in all, it's a pretty tidy haul. Estimated to be worth a few thousand dollars. There are jobs to do all over the aircraft and under it as well. Today's job is taking off the slats. Oh, your arms do get a bit tired after a while. But, uh, that's when you've got to be aircraft fit. That's the split pin I was after, and that's out. So I'm just trying to get the slat track lined up to remove the stop. And I'm going to use this bit of rope to support the slat while I take the stops out. Ed Lucas is about six foot seven, which could be why everyone calls him Tall Ed. 
For Ed, it's a race against the clock to help strip out each plane that comes through here. But even for him, taking out something this big can take time. This will be for the next two days, I could imagine. So it's, uh, there's eight slats all together, four on each wing. It's a bit of a fiddly old job. So the slats are designed to work in conjunction with the flaps at the back of the wing to increase the cord of the wing, which is the depth of the wing. And by increasing that depth of the wing, you increase the lift. So on takeoff and landing, they're very important to give that aircraft the extra bit of boost it needs to get off the ground. To add to Ed's weighty workload, there's a spot of spring cleaning to do. That's because the space in the wing where the slats are housed can often pick up unusual souvenirs from the plane's globe-hopping travels. Well, you occasionally find the odd cockroach. Some days you get snowballs, some days you get sand. I had one from, uh, from the Arabian deserts the other day, and there was the finest dust I've ever come across all inside the uh, tail. It's uh, the kind of dust that blows across to the Amazon and fertilizes the forest. What a beautiful bit of imagery. But as poetic as Ed can make the dust sound, the real value here is with the slat itself, and it still needs to come off. And even this gentle giant can't manage that by himself. Oh, you'd never do it on your own. It's definitely a two-man lift. Maybe even a three-man, because one needs to pull the podgers. Pull the what was that, Ed? A podger can be anything from a, a screwdriver to an ice pick. Basically, it's a bit of metal that we use for knocking a, either knocking a bolt out or to line a bolt hole up before we put the bolt in. But we tend to use them where we'll, we'll knock bolts out and we'll leave a podger in the hole. So we're, if it's a hinged or a, like a slat or something on the front, we go all the bolts out and just leave them sitting on podgers. So when we're ready to lift it off, we just pull the podger out. It's a, yeah, a general pointy bit of metal. <laughs> Ed will have to come back to his podgers later. Right now, this plane needs a nose job. Sam's in charge of this operation. Before they can take the nose off, they have to strip out a very clever bit of kit tucked inside. Today's first job, or one of the jobs, is to remove the weather radar. This clever bit of kit is on almost all passenger aircraft. It's a crucial part of the plane. So, what exactly is a weather radar, then? It's just like an antenna dish that you see. It's where everybody's idea of a, a radar dish, so that moves backwards and up and down. Don't um, ask me any more about what it does, because uh, I honestly don't know. What Sam does know is that this bit on the front of the aircraft is purpose-built to protect the radar. So it's not just a nose, it's actually something called a ray dome. The dome itself is made out of um, fiberglass, I believe. So um, the radar waves, I think they're called, will go through it and come back in and what have you. If it was a metal ray dome, it wouldn't work. All right? The radar, I mean, yeah, you've got to be careful with it. You don't want to dent it, especially the dish. And then in the, in the motor and all that, it's... There's a lot of delicate uh, wiring and the likes in there. So you need to be careful with it. Thanks a lot. Got it? Yeah, cool. Thank you. No idea on price, but just looking at it, it doesn't look cheap, does it? <laughs> so you're looking, you're looking a few bucks there, I think. Each and every one of the thousands of valuable components being carefully removed from the aircraft is tagged and photographed and catalogued to show their new owner the condition each item is in. It falls to Maz to keep a record of each piece that comes off. Are you right on the lad or to get and a Sam's bit? happy to help by reaching into some of the harder to reach spots. Do you want me to photograph it for me? I've got a ladder if you want. It turns out there's a reason why Sam isn't usually trusted with this job. He may have a deft touch with a spanner set, but clearly he's all fingers and thumbs when it comes to working a camera. No. Is it just a quick dab on the button, is it? Yeah. It's got it that time, I think. Yeah. Cool. After finally finding the camera's shutter, Sam's back to doing something he knows a little bit more about, removing the highly valued radome from the front of the plane. 
they don't tend to be quite um, a sought after bit. I mean, it's right at the front of the aircraft at the pointy end, so it's the bit that's going to get hit by any birds, other debris, so it's the easiest bit to get damaged, so uh, they do change them quite regularly, I believe. But although it should come off easily, it's not. Have you got, um... oh, I've got it. I've got no fingernails here. Get these washers off. What's needed to get the washer off is a useful bit of kit. But with no podgers at hand, Ed has another tool for the job. Mum's best knife, is it? Uh, <laughs> hey, that cost a pretty penny, that. It is the poshest uh, paint scraper I've ever come across. The radome itself is reasonably robust. It's a two-man lift to get it down off the aircraft. You jump up, mate, please. This one's a pain. It's got a ring of screws all the way around it, so it takes a bit longer to get it open. What we need to do is do a bit of hovering, right. so the lifter will come up. <laughs> you go up onto an Airbus, it's just got two quick-release catches on it, so it's, yeah, it's um, techie-friendly, really, you know. But it seems the latches on this nose won't be picked. And to top it off, the scissor lift is now also refusing to go any higher. Oh, what a nose. It's you. <laughs> you fatty here. Yeah, please, start again. <laughs> with the scissor lift back in action, Sam can crack on with the 737's makeover. It changes the whole appearance of the aircraft, doesn't it? When you, when you lose that, so uh, be good. I suppose they lose their identity a little bit. So the, note, the front of the nose is gone, the top of the fin is gone. So, uh, you know, it's changing, changing what it was, you know. There we go, got it. Some of the air crew that come in the hangar, some of the pilots and that more, they're like, they see their jaws drop a little bit, because they, they, they don't normally see this end of it. They're used to seeing a nice shiny aeroplane with all the bits on it, that <laughs> they can go and fly around the world. This nose has been bought by an airline to keep as a spare part. Price tag, around $30,000. But the all-important wings are still a work in progress. Tall Ed has found two pocket-sized volunteers to help him remove the slats from the wing. Towering head and shoulders over everyone else, Ed can reach the heights others can only dream of, while it looks as if his pint-sized pals might have to totter on their tiptoes Ed will need to watch that he doesn't crack his cranium. But now the cherry picker's decided to have another sulk, and it's refusing to go any higher. It seems that three is a crowd, and Ed's got himself one glamorous assistant too many. Now that Ed's lightened his load, he can get on with the job at hand, and that's playing with his podger. I think what's best is if you pull that podger, yeah. I'll pull this podger, and then we just yeah, drop it. OK? Whatever it is, all that podger pulling seems to have yeah. worked a treat. So that was a successful lift then. I was happy with that. My plan uh, come to fruition. The slats are a vital section of the wing to increase an aircraft's lift, and they've been bought by an airline to be used when needed as a spare part. But Ed's job's not done just yet. Well, this is uh, number eight slat, so now it's seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. That should keep him busy for a while. <laughs> By stripping the most valuable components off the plane, the techies in the hangar have played their part. Now it's time to shift what's left of this towering tin can outside to meet its crushing end. First, they have to gas up the landing gear. Once the legs are pumped up, it's ready to roll. The man who's top of the pecking order in these parts is chicken, and this backyard is the size of a professional football pitch. It's surprising how big it is, uh, but then when you try and fit eight aircraft in here, it soon shrinks down to next to nothing. As usual for chicken, the pressure is on. The planes just keep coming in and time just keeps flying. 
today is another time sensitive day, another mad rush. Uh, we've got a 320 and a 737 on the yard, all bar one wing have been removed at the moment. Uh, then to follow that we've got two 767s, another A320 and, and to be honest I don't even know. I know there's, I think there's a total of eight they're going to try and get on here at the moment with the two 767s. So it's going to be very tight. That's a serious bunch of numbers to juggle. With such hefty tonnage of aircraft due in, there's only one way chicken is going to stuff them all into the yard. Get the angle grinders out to clip their wings. The boys have cut the lower surface and they've cut the sides. So uh, it won't be long now before they'll be cutting across the top and dropping a wing on the floor. Far away. Right then, let's go for lunch. <laughs> it looks like chicken may be having wings for lunch. But Sam is staying behind to sort out the mess, and he's not a happy chappy. Worst job going, isn't it? Sweetheart, oh, that's shocking, that. They've just chopped the wings off these, so now we've got to clear the mess up before we uh, move the aircraft so we don't get any crunches. We don't want any bits of metal in the aircraft tyres, and we definitely don't want them in the tractor tyres. Since they're all new tyres, would be very popular then, would I? Run the sweepstake, are you, Sam? So I think I'll be rather emptying the bogs than doing this. That can be arranged. Earlier, this cockpit was chock a block with expensive and sophisticated instruments. Having been removed with precision and care by the techs, it's the turn of the lads in the yard to get rid of what's left. And they take an altogether less subtle approach to their work. Are we ready, boys? Ready when you are, mate. We've got the, uh, the plane behind me, we've got the cockpit, we've got to get that off, the flight deck. It's going to be a guillotine cut, not an L cut. So it's going to be a straight down cut. We've got that prep ready now. Before we cut it, we're going to have a little check. Hello! Once it comes away, you and Carl leap down and give us a quick hand with this, because we, we've got to do the Fandango, haven't we? I'm told the Fandango can be one of two things. It's either a lively Spanish dance accompanied by castanets, or it's an elaborate and complicated process or activity. Fandango is not a uh, Spanish dance with uh, castanets. It's the uh, communication that we uh, use between ourselves and the crane driver to ensure that uh, the equipment that we're taking off the aircraft gets down on the ground safely. The team are trying to saw the cockpit off of the main body of the fuselage. But having sliced their way through it, it seems to be still hanging by a thread. Yeah, yeah. it's loose, I can feel it move it. I'll do this, something by you. The crew outside are there to make sure everyone stays safe and the cockpit doesn't crash to the ground when it comes off. The moment of truth. With one last slash, the cockpit is finally free. Right, we're just doing a guillotine uh, cut on the nose of this aircraft and it's just broken free, so excuse me just a second. All right, guys, get yourselves out of the way. All right, mate. With the cockpit now clear of the fuselage, Perry's ready to party. Nice one, guys. Working in conditions like this is brilliant. You haven't got the rain, the wind, especially with craning, it's a lot easier. Everyone's happy. All we're missing now is a case of Stella. <laughs> That's all we're missing. That come off lovely, that did. Really, really happy with that. All I have to do now is get the nose safely on the ground. We'll, we'll do the Fandango dance now. All right. Maybe those castanets will be coming well, out after all. Oh, or maybe not. As this cockpit's dancing to its own tune. Might be easier if we put a sleeper down rather than those little bits of wood. Andy in the crane has a few signature moves that he'd like to share with the lads to help get the cockpit onto the deck. Grab that sleeper with his car. Actually, it's quite a good idea, that is, boys. It's not just a pretty face, you know. Bring him down a little bit, Andy. 
Hang on. Right. It seems there's a bit more fancy footwork needed before this Fandango is finally through. Now this ends flipping now. Two seconds, two seconds, mate. Sorry, mate. What we're gonna have to do, right? If I'm pulling it around because of the head coming around, it's looking to lift it's, it. It's gonna flick it around. It's, go, it's gonna look to lift. So if we turn, if I take that up a bit, turn our sleeper a bit, it might come around a bit better because I'm pulling it. With Andy taking the lead, it now looks like everyone can dance to the same tune. Furthest then, further up. Every time we do this, it's a mini learning curve. Uh, but uh, with the experience of the green driver, uh, giving us a gen on where to put the uh, sleeper, it's down safely. So, happy days. Well, that's down. And with that, the cockpit fandango is done. We're all working together, cohesive unit. That's a good word for a Wednesday, actually, isn't it? With the cockpit all removed, this is all that's left of what used to be a shiny new generation Boeing 737-700. This is the end of the road for the aircraft. Uh, everything that's uh, expensive has been removed and uh, what's left is just scrap now. This is truly the end of the road where the remains of the planes get completely obliterated. There's no time to lose. It's almost a production line at the moment. The way they're tearing them down pretty fast. They come onto the yard. Uh, we've got to do our job as quick as we can and get the demolition team in uh, to just shift these aircraft through. The faster we get these cut and smashed up, the better for everyone. With no time to waste, the powerful jaws of these two massive crushers work together for maximum effect. Like two giant dinosaurs devouring its prey, these monster-sized wrecking machines tear the carcass of the 737 to pieces. Uh, it looks like chaos here. Um, it is, but it's organised chaos. The demolition team smash it up into the uh, smallest they physically can, really, to get as much weight on the, uh, the trucks as possible, uh, and they ship it up country then to the recycling centre. I mean, there's going to be a lot of aviation enthusiasts that would probably be uh, quite tearful, I suppose, seeing these aircraft uh, dragged across the floor into the corner um, and then smashed up to, to, to nothing. To me, it's the complete opposite. I'm quite glad to see the back of them. I've done my bit, I've done my job. They're now just in the way. And so I'm more than happy for them to be smashed up, removed, and then start the job again. From start to finish, it's taken this wrecking crew less than two hours to turn what was a miracle of modern engineering into a sorry-looking stack of scrap metal. From here, scrap metal companies will take these remnants away and turn them into other manufacturing goods. And who knows, some of the high tensile aluminium may even end up being used in the fuselage of a new aircraft. So, somebody may well be flying in it again.